hello, hello, Lucy hello. Frost. Yay, so Hi, glad Tamara. to have you. And Andromeda is here too. Andromeda, are you Yay. competing in the Ironman right away? Did I see that? Is that true? Hey, Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Hi. Andromeda, didn't you like bike 56 miles uphill this week? Oh. Andromeda is still correct, connecting to audio. So, hi, Lucy. How's hi, Texas? Tamara. Texas is not so. <laughs> you know, like always. Thank but you for being a tiny island of sanity in Texas. <laughs> oh my God, it's crazy. Every day I wake up and Ted Cruz has done some fresh hell. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Relentless, that one, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Katrina. How's Alaska? Oh, God, don't ask. <laughs> this is our second day of snow. Oh, oh my gosh. It's 103 here yesterday. Oh, my gosh. Well, that doesn't <laughs> sound wonderful, but somewhere in the middle sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> It's 103 in Dubai right now, too. Oh, my God. Okay, I, wow. does everybody want to come over to my house? Because it's 67 in Bucks County oh. with only 24% humidity. Yes. Oh I mean, soon it will be just like so humid constantly. <laughs> right, Abby? <laughs> Abby and I are almost neighbors. Uh, but temperature today, ideal. Oh, it, it is. We perfect. used we used to call that funny weather. When I performed outside, everyone is 50% funnier if it is 70 degrees and sunny outside. <laughs> <laughs> when it's hotter, you're not as funny. And Lucy, in Texas, you have to talk slower on the punchline, not because people in Texas are dumb, but because people in Texas habitually talk slower. And if you rattle that punchline out like you're in New York, nobody's going to catch it. Oh my gosh. The anyway, wisdom sure. that is Allison K. Williams. Honestly, yeah. I will never get enough, Allison. <laughs> Yay. That's how I feel about you. That's how I oh. feel about our little community. I know. It's Wonderful. Like we're almost community. at, we're almost at two years. Can you believe it? Of doing I think these writers for it. I know. I can't believe it. Oh, by the way, you guys get kind of the sneak preview because you're here a little bit early, which is that the next episode is going to be do-overs, which is one of our favorite things to do. And so if you have a social post that you thought should have flown and actually flopped, send it along. And um, I'm also going to take a look at uh, a couple of um, writing pieces that have gotten lots of rejections. So uh, if you have something that should fly and in, instead flopping, let us know. We want to talk about it and help you make it what it should be. Yep. Live do-overs and live editing are probably our two favorite things to do. They really are. They really I really are. like, I really like doing them. I was doing some master classes last week and I did the do-overs without looking at them first. And I loved that. I love that. I was like, okay, what do we got? All right. So then yeah. you kind of get to see the thought process a little bit while I'm organizing um, the, the words, but I think that it's, yeah, Plus, for, for everybody, right? Did you like it, Trish? For everybody. Oh my God, you go like this, like Karnak. You go, you don't, you, have, you don't realize you did it. You go like, and I'm going, oh my God, she's like Karnak. Do you remember <laughs> from Johnny Carson? Oh, she goes. <laughs> so Trish, Trish, I was born in 1980. So I need to Google that. Yes. <laughs> I do, but I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing what you mean, right? It's like, you had the turban. Okay. You had the, yep. Oh, a turban. Okay, so it's like, like I'm actually channeling it. Yes, I, I, I accept that. Yes. So yeah. I just want to let everybody know that we do have the subtitles set up for this meeting. If you would like to be watching the subtitles, which I would say are about 95% accurate, Zoom does pretty good subtitles. You can go into those three dots that say more at the bottom right of your screen if you're on laptop, and you can select either show subtitle if you're not seeing them and you would like to be, or if you're seeing them and you find them distracting, you can select hide subtitle and it will take them away for you. And thank you, Diane. I always appreciate that you cue us to enable the subtitles because I don't always remember and I need to remember. So thank you very much. Awesome. I am going to mute everyone. So Allison, if you could unmute yourself. We have lots of people still popping in the meeting, but the Writer's Bridge always starts on time. So we are going to get going with our Ask Us Anything episode. 
We are so excited today to be talking about your publications, your questions, publication platform, getting paid. We are here to help. We have a ton of emailed questions and we're also gonna be hearing from all of you in the chat. We will be picking up questions as we go. So please do feel free to drop those questions in the chat as you think of them. Before we start, we just want to share some feedback we got from an Express Lane member. Express Lane is uh, our weekly uh, email where you get an email every Monday and Friday with a tiny platform building bite that uh, takes, we hope it takes 15 minutes, but let's be real, it usually takes a little bit longer than that until you've practiced it for a little bit. And we got a lovely message today. Somebody said, I'm heading into my book launch and it would not be the same without your incredible insight. Thank you, thank you. You are so welcome. We are so glad the Express Lane is helping. And if anyone else is interested, please do check it out at thewritersbridge.com slash Express Lane. Over to you, Ashley. Hi, everybody. So first of all, we call this the writer's bridge because a platform is something you climb up on top of and yell at people from. And we are about building horizontal loyalty, getting to know the people who give a crap about the same things we give a crap about. Okay. And reaching out a hand and seeing who reaches back, reaching out a hand, seeing who reaches back and seeing what else we can learn from them about our topic or the way to communicate better. So that's why we call this the writer's bridge, building an audience, building a bridge to your audience. So all of our questions are questions of the week this week. So we're just going to dive right in. Gabrielle asks, as I plan my social media calendar each week using the wisdom you've shared, thanks. There is one area I'm struggling with. I have collected lots of positive testimonials from participants in my writing workshops, but I feel awkward sharing them even when I've designed them as fun quotes for Instagram. Some of you may also be experiencing this. You've got good quotes in your Amazon book reviews. You'd like to share them, but gosh, we've spent a lot of time being told we have to be nice and lift up other people. And is it too much like bragging? Ashley, how would you address that? Okay, so there are a few different ways that we can do this. Just popping up a testimonial on its own, even if it's designed attractively, sometimes feels a little cold or um, a little sparse as far as offering value to our community. So one way that you can do this is if you are offering a writing tip in a, a a static post or a quote card carousel or a reel where you are going through XYZ about this tip. When you have a testimonial that relates to that, it can naturally go onto the tail end of your post. And you can say, now enrolling, two week XYZ course, here's what previous students are saying. Okay, so that it ties it in, you're already offering something and telling people something that will be helpful to them. And then you say, and there's more of that. And here are some of the transformations and results people are getting. It becomes what we call social proof, like, hey, this thing works and here's who says why. I also have two other strategies for this. One is just own it. If you can't hide it, tie bells on it. Say, go ahead and write, please join my deep embarrassment in sharing this cool thing that Jenny Patel said about me or my book. Um, me, I'm finally getting my newsletter in gear on Flowdesk after being like deeply sporadic. And I'm starting a second email list that is just events because a couple of people have said, hey, I just want to get the events. And I actually wrote, I feel weird about being all salesman -y, but please sign up for my events only list. Like just go ahead and call it out. The other thing you can do is you can use this as a chance to get meaningful. You can share, why does this testimonial mean something to you? Is this a compliment about something you've worked hard to learn? Was this a difficult part in your book that really touched somebody's heart? Is this a moment of growth you were really glad to have or a moment of growth you were really glad to see in a student? So all of those are ways to handle blowing your own horn without feeling like you're being obnoxious about it. Love that. Okay, our next question is from Shelly. She's saying she's got 100 people on her email list, but she has a 50 to 60% open rate. So she's thinking those are solid contacts. Those are beyond solid contacts. Those are incredible, incredible contacts. So the average open rate for a successful email list is like 10 to 15%. So if you are above that, you are 
doing wonderfully. Now, um, when you first get people on your email list, however that is, if you have an invite on Facebook, if you have a freebie, um, if you have a freebie related to your topic, this is definitely the easiest way to get people on your list uh, in exchange for that tip sheet or whatever you're offering. Make it small, make it one sheet. You don't want to give them homework. You just want to give them a quick solution. When they sign up, my favorite trick for training people to open my emails and my favorite trick for making sure that my email goes to the right place is to have a success message right on that page when they opt in that says when they put in their name, put in their email, they hit enter immediately. They're not even taking to another page. That enter button turns into this little success message that says my email should be in your inbox right now. In case if it ended up in spam or promotions, drag it, click OK, do these things so that it always ends up in the right place. So I have about an 87% open rate for that initial email. That is the time when people are the warmest. They have found you online and they've said, oh, this person has information that I need right now. They sign up impulsively. They go right to their email. I would love people to be looking at your freebie within 60 seconds of first encountering you online. Yes. So Shelly also asks, she says she's doubled her signup list this year with forms and posts on Facebook, but she's noticed Facebook doesn't like it when you take people's attention off the site. And she also says, I suspect that when you give people free stuff, they sign up, but they aren't necessarily interested in purchasing your products so much as they want to get something for free. Okay, so this is true. Yes, I myself am totally guilty of, I signed up, I got the free thing, and then I unsubscribed. One of the challenges is to give them something that gets them closer to your brand. It's not just like a fun thing that they get to have, get to keep. It's something that brings them closer to who you are, brings them closer to the mission that you want to share. Ashley, you just did a recent giveaway. What makes it something that brings your readers closer together rather than just going, oh, hey, I got the thing. I'm done now. Bye. Yeah. Okay. So my most successful freebie is a keeping it hot tip sheet. I've, it's brought in probably 15,000 people since October. And I never did a freebie before that. Um, what it does super simple. And it's very, very, very related to my reels. And it's very, very related to my next book, which is keeping it hot, the workbook. So it's like, do you want this part of your relationship to be easier and more fun? I got you. So it's really consistently that answering the same question or solving offering solutions to the same problem. Um, most people will not buy. Most people who are on your list will not sign up for a paid newsletter, will not buy your book. But if you have 50 or 60% of people opening your email and 3% of people actually hitting the buy button or signing up for your course or signing up for your paid newsletter, you are doing incredibly well. And you are still connecting with all of these other people on a regular basis. Um, and you never know when that person is going to turn into a reader or turn into a, a maybe they're even a podcast sponsor. Um, I was, I had someone on my list who came in through that keeping it hot um, PDF. I sent out an email to my big list about social media strategy. And then he hired me to speak at his conference for agricultural um, CEOs who are independent seed company owners. Okay. Yeah. Arizona. And I'm charging $12,000 for that day. Right. Because he had, he had seen me connecting with my audience. And then I had said, Hey, and I do strategy for business owners. And he was like, I know, I know her strategy because I came in through her strategy. So you just never know. You just never know. He wasn't a paid newsletter um, subscriber or anything. You just never know when you have this larger group of people, when something is going to click and then you're going to become connected in another way. And as much as you can try and come up with that giveaway that gets people to sign up for your mailing list, gets people to sign up for your thing, try to come up with a giveaway that 
makes them more interested in what you have to do. Um, we're going to get in a minute to uh, Shelly's other question, which is, is it more valuable to write a novella and offer, oh, we're getting to it now, and offer it as a PDF or build the story into a full length novel? My first book is coming out in March, 2023. It's a mystery with a rom-com vibe, which sounds awesome. And I'm trying to get out of this. I'm trying to get out ahead of the promotion stuff. So the, no the novella will support the novel rather than the other way around. For fiction writers, consider favorite book lists. If you've got a series of books out, write an imaginary epilogue for one of your books or a side story for a specific character that people like. Think about reviewing other books in your genre or interviewing other authors in your genre and putting that in your newsletter. Um, there's an author named Jessica Jarlvie who is in our larger community. And Jessica has a really great newsletter that I highly recommend you sign up for if you are a fiction writer, because it really shows how a novelist can connect with their audience on a regular basis. What I've found as a nonfiction writer, um, and as someone who my work is helping people write better, like that's my mission. So to be honest, even if they never buy anything from me, I'm real happy if they bring better words into the world, because that just fulfills me as a human. And that's what I want to see happen so that we can all read better books and we can all get our stories out there. But also... I, you probably saw it on Facebook today, or maybe you saw it on Twitter. My husband, who is a database wizard, created this giant like marketing launch database where you check off the activities you want to engage in. Do you like teaching? Do you like speaking? Which social media networks are you on? And it spits out a list of tasks and the dates to do them on relative to your launch date. And I'm like, holy crap, this is amazing. And so I'm using it as a giveaway to get people to sign up to a webinar, which I will get paid for. But then ideally, the giveaway will also be something where I can help people with, hey, here's the class where we learn to write a press release and who to send it to. Hey, here's the activity where we learn what part of our book is newsworthy, because unfortunately, I wrote a book is not especially newsworthy, but there is something about your work that, you know, belongs in your local paper. And so for me, I think this giveaway is going to be a really valuable thing because it makes people need me more. It doesn't make them need me less. You know, when people get Ashley's Keeping It Hot PDF, they're like, hey, this is great sex advice. Please continue to fill my bedroom with sex advice. You know, it, it brings them closer. It's not just a one and done. We're, we're like, you know, in the long run, we're kind of like heroin dealers. First one's free. <laughs> then you're just going to keep coming back for more. And for fiction writers, this is trickier, right? This is trickier, figuring out how the hell to do that. So look at some of your favorite fiction writers. Do they create a world that people become immersed and obsessed with? Or do they become, do they create kind of this cult of personality like Colleen Hoover, where everybody wants to weigh in on what they want to happen in the next book and they're living it out almost like these, you know, they have parasympathetic relationships with these characters. And Colleen feels off that and gives people, you know, little tidbits and, and so much merchandise where, you know, they have like inside jokes on the merchandise. So take a look at, you don't, you don't have to do both, right? And you could do something in the middle, but take a look at what you are attracted to in novelists who you love and take a look at how specifically they are creating this experience of more, more, I get to be immersed with this author in their environment. Yeah. We have a great question that came in through the chat from Cheryl. I publish through Ingram. When I call a bookstore, is it correct to ask if they would stock my book? And if they want to work out a consignment deal, what's the best percentage or offer to accept? Ashley, you are the expert on getting your book into the physical bookstore. How do you make that happen? Okay. I am the expert on that. I'm not the expert on consignment deals. So I'm going to say this first. I am the expert on consignment deals. Great. Don't do them. They're a shit ton of paperwork. They're a pain in the ass to maintain. And it's difficult for you and for the bookstore. If you don't think they're going to sell confidently enough, just say, please take these three copies and see if they sell and then kiss it goodbye and hope that it's great later. Ashley, back to you. 
Yes. Okay. If your book is listed, if your book is listed on Ingram and it's uh, listed as returns are allowed. So I mark all of my books as return destroy, because if a bookstore, you know, I have a couple returns, a handful of returns that are coming back right now from bookstores that stocked swing a year ago. I don't want that book to end up on my front step because it's probably going to be a mess. And then I have to pay for shipping back. Okay. So return destroy is what I pick. And then you have to have a discount that makes it attractive for bookstores. And that is the standard 55% off of retail price. The bookstore gets about 40%. Ingram, Ingram Spark gets about 15% because they have to distribute it all around. That makes sense. Um, then the bookstore will order it if you already have a customer who wants it. So the best way to get a bookstore aware of your book is to ask the people who are going to read it to order it from their local bookstore. A lot of people just have chosen the most convenient thing for years, but we are at an incredible place in history where most people want to develop better habits and they want to become more aware of more conscious buying decisions and the impact that their dollars have. Right In a world that feels out of control, we want to know, what do I have control over? So informing, educating your audience about the benefits to an author for buying from an independent bookstore, those sales actually are weighted more heavily for bestseller lists, and that when that bookstore sees that book coming through, they are more likely to stop, flip through, say, huh. I think that this would be good for our in-store book club. I think that we should get a couple on the shelf. The people who call and order this book are so excited. You know what? I'm going to display it cover out instead of spine out. Okay. Those are all little decisions that a human makes and nothing makes a bookseller more excited than people opening their wallet and saying, I want that book. Exactly. And as authors, especially if we're self-publishing or we're publishing with a small press, it can feel really counterintuitive to go, okay, I'm going to give the 55% discount and this is going to be return destroy. And I got to tell you, I have gotten heartbreaking statements from Ingram from my first book that published like eight years ago. And it's like, oh, I owe Ingram $5. They'll be taking it out of my next royalties. But in the long term, if you want to sell your book like a professional, the professionals are selling their books at 55% return and destroy, because that is the plan that makes the most sense for the bookstores. It is worth it to give up a dollar or $2 a book in royalties to get your book into the stores that want to carry your book. And it is an extra barrier if it is not return, if it is not destroy. And it is an extra barrier if it is not the standard discount, like Penguin Random House is doing destroy and 55%, you know, so you want to line yourself up with the professionals as well. Yeah. And I just put in the chat too, spoiler, very, very few authors make the majority of their money off book sales. Like even Mel Robbins, right? Who was a self-published New York Times bestseller and now has sold millions and millions of copies. She makes way more money speaking than selling books. Okay. Yeah. So just, we just have to remember that like the book, the book is like this dream we've had for our whole life. And then once it happens, it's sort of like a really fancy calling card or a really yeah. fancy business card, right? Um, so it can do all these different things. Uh, so just it, book sales need to be one part of your whole strategy as far as being a professional writer in your field. And that's why it's so important to be in touch with your mission, because on one hand, it's really nice to make a dollar on a book that's sold through my publisher where I get a much lower royalty rate than if I sold it myself. On the other hand, it is freaking priceless to wake up to a DM in my Twitter inbox that says, I just got to chapter six and I feel like I'm making my book better. And that for me is really worth it. And I say this from a place of privilege. I am not depending on my book sales to make money, but I'm going to say 95% of authors are not going to make a living on their book sales. So have another reason for doing it. Have a mission for why you want to get your book into the world, who it matters to have read this book and do everything you can to reach those people without actively losing money.
and then find some book adjacent ways to make money because your book is unfortunately probably not going to be a main source of income ever. It may be a really pleasant set of money to go out to dinner with once a month. It is probably never going to be pay the mortgage money. Mm-hmm. And I say that with great respect because it's not, it's not about your talent and it's not about your hard work. It's just the way the market works. It is. And it can open a lot of other opportunities uh, for speaking, for coaching. I self-published a really successful book. So a lot of my coaching is teaching other people how to do that in the topic or in the audience or that they're trying to reach. Right. Um, and for professors, if you're teaching English, having a book with a small press definitely helps you get tenure more easily um, for teaching webinars. I mean, just makes you more, more it um, grants experience, you legitimacy. Right? It does yeah. grant legitimacy. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Which brings us into a really interesting question from Katrina. Katrina says, I'm halfway through the draft of my memoir about the damage done by parents who withheld love and approval, the self-destructive ways I tried to fix the damage and how I finally learned to love myself and forgive them. Great story. Current events make me think the story might be more important and have more legs if I change the focus. My history of poor choices sexually, sister, I recognize you, in a desperate need to feel love might be really timely if I change the focus to fit the current and ongoing hot topics of misogyny and women's rights. Does it make sense to change my story's focus to take advantage of current events? I know the current events won't be current by the time my book would be published, but I have a feeling this particular set of issues isn't going away in the next two or three years. So first, let me share your sadness that these events will probably still be current at that time. But yes, A memoir that ties into the larger culture will always be an easier sell than one is purely about our own experience. Keep asking, what's in it for the reader? What is the reader going to learn? How will the reader grow? I recently worked with an author who is a very talented writer. And he's our very own Brian Watson. And Brian is working on a memoir. And go ahead and unmute yourself when you're ready, Brian. Brian is working on a memoir about growing up as a gay man in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, a big chunk of which was spent in Japan. And one of the things we discovered when we were working on his book, there's this marvelous section in one of his chapters about the evolution of gay porn in the 70s, like how porn magazines evolved. And it's fascinating, just like the way different photography styles came in and where you could buy these magazines. And I I said to Brian, you know, well, what if this book was more about the evolution of gay culture as experienced by you rather than your personal story? So Brian, I think you felt kind of invigorated by that. How has that changed your writing process? Uh, It's interesting because, um, you know, one of the things that you said to me was, was that I had you know, a lot of the book was was on um, grief and about, you know, the death of my father and, and stuff like that. And you said, you know, <laughs> there's a, a shit ton of, of memoirs about dead parents. Um, you know, if we if we come around and and look uh, more at this at this arc that involves Japan at, at gay evolution, then you're you're going to have a bigger hook for agents. Right. So um, for me, that permission to go into hybrid memoir mode was really liberating. Um, and in part, I, 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 you know, I told Allison this directly, I laughed because I had been planning a hybrid memoir in the very beginning. And then as I wrote the first draft, I got so involved in the getting the shit on paper that I just forgot about the hybrid part and then went with it for like eight revisions. And then, oh, <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, you know, the AIDS pandemic, HIV pandemic, it is it is current events. It's not over, but it's also the way we've handled COVID-19, right? Same thing. Ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I this, That advice has definitely reinvigorated me. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next steps. And it's invigorated me as well, because as an editor, I was starting to feel like a liar that I was telling people, oh, just keep working on this book. Just keep working on this book. You know, build your platform more. Let's sell this book. And it was really great to discover, okay, yeah, there are some books that are going to stand on their own on the beauty of the writing, on the compellingness of the story. 
But for, I would say about 50% of memoirists, we are better off having a tie-in to the larger culture, having a tie-in that has a definite takeaway for the reader. Um, a book that's forthcoming this year from a woman I worked with called Karen Fine, who's a veterinarian. And Dr. Fine wrote a book that is partly about the death of her dog. And I mean, we've all ha heard the dead pet story. It is not a new story. But what her book is about is how do you deal with your pet's end of life issues when the people around you are saying, oh, come on, it's just a dog. You know, how do you know when it's time to say, I'm not going to spend $6,000 on another kidney for Fluffy. And this book is something that people need because it tells her experience, but it speaks to them. It addresses their issues. It addresses their problems. Ashley, you want to chime in on this? Yeah, I just want to say um, the title is The Other Family Doctor, right? And she's a vet. Yep. Like, I just love. Like I get, I get like little chills every time um, you mention her because I, I know the work you did to help her and it's just brilliant. And then she got a great book deal, right? With big five. Um, random, yeah. Penguin Random House. Yeah, we took that book apart on a retreat in Italy and pieced it on index cards on a brick wall and then put it all back together again. I mean, and sometimes you just need those, that outside set of eyes to just do that. Well, and honestly, to hold space for you while that is done to your book, right? To go, we're gonna rip this apart, but hey, we're gonna have it put back together before we leave this villa in Tuscany. I mean, amazing. Okay, so we have another question here. Kim asks, Kim says she's self-publishing her memoir in a few months. How do I start to talk about my upcoming book and get the word out without social media? I know I can use my newsletter, but I barely have any subscribers. So. We do not need to do any of this on social media. It's an excellent tool. It's one that I harnessed and I had a lot of fun. Um, wasted a lot of time, wasted a lot of money, but most of all, I had a lot of fun trying to figure out the moving parts of it, trying to figure out what is the system here? How do these things work and how can we replicate that? But if you don't love social media, don't don't really waste your time there because it's going to feel like you're just shouting into a void and what you really want to do is connect 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 so ask yourself how you already connect with people in real life ask you know on your subject matter that you're writing about um where do those people meet up do they, are there support groups are there already discussion groups going on because maybe there are already like facebook groups where you're going to have conversations with these people so it's on social media but it's not about like a social media posting strategy for you social media becomes the venue and the amplifier rather than your primary tool and yeah definitely go where the readers are that's really what's going to help you the most Great question in the chat that is coming in from Derek. He is looking for add-ons for a Kickstarter for a children's picture book. He already has library and school donations, library and school readings, Zoom calls with the writer and or illustrator, an ebook to go with the print copy, printed coloring pages, and maybe plushies, but that's kind of a higher cost. So what could he offer as a Kickstarter add-on? Um, I would say some of the original art from the book, if that's an option, or framed prints of the arts in the book. Um, maybe like a fun t-shirt. If there's a character who has a fun message in the book, like, you know, Jimmy Turtle says, eat your soup, you know, something like that in both child and adult sizes would be really fun. Um, if anybody else has merch ideas for Derek or things that would make you buy a picture book and a Kickstarter, Go ahead and type those into the chat. Okay. Um, I say, I say, I oh, say, ahead, I say merch too. And the best kind of merch is inner joke merch. Okay. Like Allison said, eat your soup, right? It's like, it's like this little inner joke that then people can wear and people are going to, and other people are going to say, Hey, what does that mean? They're like, Oh my gosh, this is a great children's book that's coming out for my friend, Derek, because when people know you before your book comes out, what they're gonna say to everyone, even if they just know you online, is my friend Derek wrote a book. My friend Lucy wrote a book. Okay. So they're because they're already in the inner circle. So something that that makes them feel like there's even more of a connection that's shared is helpful. 
Like for example, Lucy just typed into the chat, like Jenny Lawson, she's the blog ass. She wrote, let's pretend this never happened. She has a catchphrase, knock, knock motherfucker. And it ties into a six foot metal chicken named Beyonce. And if you know the story, it is one of the funniest things you have ever heard. And it will be one of those pieces of merchandise that makes you identify with other people who have also invested in the product. Lynn asks, if I've been published in a country, which in her case is South Africa, and own my international rights, can I be on Kindle as a self-publisher, or does it serve me to go under the original publisher imprint? I also have an audio book. Well, the very first thing to do is look at your contract and find out what you own. Make double sure that you, you own what you think you own. The second thing is look in your contract and see if they have a right of first refusal on any of those rights. Then also go ahead and look online because I found out that my publisher was actually selling my book more widely than they had originally contracted for. And it wasn't like skulldudgery or anything on their part. It's just the way that the Amazon stuff got set up. And it turned out to be easier and less hassle for me to just say, you know what, pay me more for these rights than it would be for me to actually go through the process of selling the book myself on, on Amazon or, you know, even through my website. So I would say, Check in with the publisher and find out, do they want these rights? And if so, what will they pay you for them? Then the other thing you might do, if you work with an agent, ask your agent if it's possible to sell those rights. And you might also contact a couple of publishers. If your book is selling well in the venues where it's already selling well, contact some similar small publishers and say, hey, I am very interested in selling the US rights to my book. Here is how it is selling in South Africa. Would you be interested in talking to me? Or you could even approach a US agent in that way if you've got solid book sales. Mm -hmm. But it really is up to you to decide, is the hassle of selling it myself worth the amount of income I would make? However, if I was you and I was trying to start doing more business as a writer worldwide, I probably would want to do whatever I needed to do to get my book into North America, because that is the, the 900 pound gorilla in the market right there. Ashley, do you have any comments on that? Yeah. So Lynn has dropped a couple of comments in the chat here. She's sure she owns the rights. Um, what you can do if you know you own the rights and you have access to the EPUB or you have access to a file that you can get converted into an EPUB, you can upload it to Kindle through KDP. Um, I recommend that no one go exclusive with Kindle or Kindle Unlimited, but, but that is um, a specific strategy that a lot of genre fiction writers use. Actually, they're Amazon exclusive and they're signed up for KU, which is Kindle Unlimited. So people who are signed up for Kindle Unlimited can read their books for free, but they get paid per page read. And especially for um, romantic uh, romance novels, the reader, the average romance reader reads one book a day. I heard. Okay. Wow. So they, they go through the page count is, is really high. And there's this real, like, um, there's this real cultish type community where you get um, street cred, screen cred by reading as many books as possible and having the first feedback. So when some authors release books, their community are really quick. Fantasy is like this too, to jump on them and then consume them, consume them, and then put up reviews. And so it's almost like a race to read it. So there, there can be substantial income coming in. If you do not have a series of books, that's probably not uh, the setup that you are going to go for. So putting it on Kindle, um, making sure that you only check the territories where you want it distributed because you can do that. And you said that you also had an audiobook, Lynn. Now, audiobooks are a great thing to self-publish because you make a whole lot more money off an audiobook than you do off other formats. And ACX um, Audible on Amazon sets the price for an audiobook based on the length. Um, so, you know, if you have like a six to nine hour audiobook, you may, you may, be, may be making like $12 a book on that um, for audio rights. So, and more people are choosing um, audiobooks than ever. So, Having that, if you already have it recorded, um, and, and something edited. you might want to do for audiobooks as well. So Lynn says in the chat she's voiced the entire thing herself. 
that is really valid and can be well worth doing. You may also want to look around and see, is there an audiobook narrator who has their own following who it might be worth hiring to read your book? Uh, one of my friends is a guy named Dion Graham. He's the reader for Dave Eggers books. Um, he is the reader for the Malcolm X autobiography. He's done a lot of high profile audio books. Um, I think he did part of Obama's book, um, but he's done some, some really high profile projects. He has his own following. People will listen to books he narrates because they're interested in his voice, as well as because they might want to check out the author. So it may also be worth exploring, is there another narrator that you like who might bring some value to the project as well? And if you've decided that you want to do it yourself or you have done it yourself, I would recommend hiring an audio engineer just to do a once over, make sure the levels are what they need to be. Um, you can Google that and learn all that and do that yourself. Uh, I tried. It's just a lot. It's a lot. So to have somebody who uh, has experience in that, I chose to hire them and uh, then get them to submit it to ACX for you. And just reminder for everybody, ACX uh, will check the sound quality of the recordings and is quite picky because they want there to be good quality uh, titles available for their customers. And it takes three to four weeks to get an approval. Yeah. Going into another question from the chat, which also ties into a question we got in advance. Courtney asks in the chat, I'm working on a historical fiction novel. I have zero author platform, no social media following. Since I'm starting from zero, what should my first step be? I am beginning to feel overwhelmed. And here's a slightly different question that has the same answer from Summer, who asks, I did Ashley's Brand It Like It's Hot masterclass last week. She said that if you want to grow your platform more quickly, stick with a smaller niche. Don't do a million different content areas. Lately, I have been dabbling and seeing slow growth. How do you decide what to focus on? Something that aligns with your book or something that you are currently living? And I think this all comes back to mission. What do you care about the most? What experience do you want your readers to have? What impact do you want your work to have on the world? So I came across this concept of personal mission about 15 or 20 years ago. And ever since my mission has been to facilitate the experience of joy and enlightenment. I have never yet come up with a better word than facilitate. So I'm just kind of sticking with it. What I want to do is I want everybody to be happy to learn stuff. And that plays out in everything I do, whether that's speaking, whether that's teaching, whether that's writing, whether that's social media, whether that's my circus performance that I used to do. I want people to love themselves and to love learning and to find joy in bringing their own work to the world. And so everything I do focuses in on that. And so I would say Summer and Courtney, think about what is your mission? What are you here on earth to do? Which sounds like a really like big complex question, but it really is something that you can apply to your actual daily life. And Chris is adding in the chat, how do I want to spend my time? How do I see myself and my book in the world? If it's important to you to have a lot of individual one-on-one -on -one conversations, you might want to follow a strategy like Ashley's strategy, where she makes herself very available on social media and answers every single person who contacts her. If you are a person who loves being out there in front of people, you might want to follow my strategy, which is do as many webinars as you possibly can so that people like me enough to buy my stuff because they have the positive experience that I want them to have. And that turns into me being able to make a living sharing that positive experience. And Deborah also makes an important point in the chat. She's writing about sexual assault and trauma and doesn't want that to be her only focus. How can I broaden it? And Carolyn has the perfect answer. What about the broader focus of helping other survivors? And you might want to look at Tia Leving's webpage, scroll all the way down to the beginning of the first page where she talks about 100 Days of Gratitude, which was part of her way of of feeling better about recovering from trauma. She's an ex-evangelical and she reaches out to other ex-evangelicals. Ashley, do you want to add anything? Like, I know I'm being kind of like ooky spooky and I'm not necessarily saying- No, and no, this is- this process by doing X, but what do you want no. to add? Listen, listen, whenever we are trying to figure out 
how we are meant to help people or bring value or reach the goals that we want to reach in life, you got to go a little beneath the surface. It's not a cookie cutter, one size fits all. Okay. What I would encourage people to ask is how is any of what I'm posting helping people? Okay. It's not really about you. It's about them. So if you post things that are uplifting, that are encouraging, that are things that get people riled up and angry, but then make them clear on what political action they're going to take, all of these things have value. So I would ask you before you post something to ask yourself, what is the person who sees this going to feel and do after they see it? If you don't know the answer, then you probably shouldn't be posting it. It's probably you're just checking a box saying, I should get something up because it's Thursday. Okay. If you say to yourself, oh, they're going to they're gonna send this to their friend who's also really active in reproductive rights. Bingo. Oh, they're going to send it, this to their friend who's also lived in the South and who always jokes about that bless your heart thing, right? That's what they're going to do after they see, Lu see Lucy's reel. Um, after they see Allison's post, they are going to send it to someone from their writer's group going, we got this. We got this. Okay. So think about what are people going to do when they see your content and who are they going to forward it to? Exactly. Exactly. And Anne asks, where is the best place to post? The best place is where your readers are. If your readers are on Facebook in a particular group, get into that group and be part of the conversation and part of the community there. If your followers are primarily on Twitter, start showing up on Twitter five or six times a day for three minutes a pop. Um, you may have noticed I look extremely active on Twitter. It really is like I'm pretty much peeing every time I tweet. So I pee and I send a couple of tweets and I retweet a couple of things and I answer my DMs. And so if you have time to pee all day, you have time to be on Twitter. But that's where a big chunk of my audience is. So go to where your audience is. Um, Shelly's got the bacon jam audience. Go for the bacon jam audience. Find out what do people love about your mission and what you have to share. Um, I want to address uh, Sawson's question, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Does an MFA in creative writing make for a better writer? Um, and I actually blogged about this this morning on Brevity. So if you want to, that's uh, brevity at wordpress, brevity.wordpress.com, where it's uh, titled, Do You Need an MFA? The Absolutely Positively Definitive Answer. And what I basically come out to is, what makes you a better writer is practice. Practice giving critique, practice getting critique, practice applying critique to your work by taking your work away and revising it and making it better. Where an MFA helps is you have peers, assignments, and deadlines. But you can give yourself peers, assignments, and deadlines. You can be in a writing group. You just have to be really disciplined about it. But if you think about it this way, a lot of MFA programs cost fifteen dollars or $20,000 a year. If someone said to you right now, you must meet with your writing group every week and write something new every week and read a craft book every month and revise things for a whole year, and then I will give you $20,000, that sounds like a pretty good deal. That sounds like a pretty good investment of time and energy in something that you care about. So you could also spend $10,000 on your own personal tuition, go to workshops, go to retreats, hire an editor, hire a coach, whatever helps you the most. An MFA creates a structure to help you with self-discipline, but a combination of workshops, webinars, writing groups, and deliberate practice will do the same. It will be more work. It will cost less money. So really think about whatever you want to get better at, you need to spend focused time practicing it. And that also applies to writing. Ashley, you want to add anything there? Yeah. So when we, we have some questions in the chat, should we blog? Should we post on Facebook? How do I know who my audience is? The answer to all of these things, I think, can be narrowed down to watch what your comp authors are doing. Okay. 
um, who's already uh, writing and reaching the audience you want to reach? Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Take a look at how they're connecting with their audiences. Are they presenting at conferences? Are they doing retreats at Omega or Kripalu every quarter? Are they speaking at get on their email list to find out what they're doing? Do they have private Facebook groups with their What are they doing? Okay, or are they super active on Twitter, like Lauren Huff or Roxanne Gay? Look at how they're connecting. Your audience is already there, okay? Taking a look at what those comp authors are doing and don't mimic any of it. Look at the gaps. Look at how would I have worded that better so people would have understand, understood? How would I answer that question or that comment so then there was clarity for people going forward? How would I have said that that would have been kinder and had more compassion and really help people along more? That's where you are going to find the gaps in between what these people are already getting from their these authors who are reaching millions of people. So what figuring out what they're not getting and also figuring out where your unique perspective lines up with that. That's what it is. You have to pay attention, pay attention to what people care about and how you would take care of them. Lynn has a great follow-up question here. The irony is I have a whole following here in South Africa, but it's in the bubble of South Africa. How do I burst out of that bubble? Lynn, as someone who lives in Dubai, the number one thing that has helped me is to function in another time zone. So pick where the people live that you want to reach and start being active online in that time zone. And I think that's going to help you a bit more getting people outside of South Africa. Um, one more question, uh, which comes into some stuff in the chat, as well as a question we got in advance. Uh, Marisa asks, since I passed 900 followers, the follower count is increasing more rapidly, but I'm getting a lot more spam with few posts. What should I do about them? Um, Jill says she's getting a lot of messages from single men who would like to share their love with a good woman who have suspiciously American names and have pictures of themselves holding a bouquet of roses or a small child. Um, there are a ton of them. They have gotten worse recently. It's not just you. Bots make tiny sums of money each and you need a bot army to make significant money. Catfishers need a significant number of leads before they get somebody who will buy their scam. So they are just fishing as widely as they possibly can. Just ignore them, don't waste your time. If they message you, block them, delete them, or just let it go, let it sit in your other folder and don't even engage with it. It's not even worth your time. Ashley, do you wanna add anything to that? I do. So 80% of my direct messages are from men who have seen my content and who are mind blown because now they finally understand something about their relationship that's been a fight for a really long time. And they're like, thank you so much. Now I'm hearing my partner or now I'm realizing I should do this to take responsibility for this or that. Many of these men have really like obscure handles. And if I had blocked all of these people when they've come in, I wouldn't have these customers who are buying my book and people who actually are subscribers to my paid newsletter. If I have a very, very low tolerance for a few things on my feed. So if anybody's pre pretending they don't know what consent is, they are blocked and deleted immediately. Um, if anybody asks me to reveal more than I've revealed in my video, they are blocked and deleted immediately. Okay. But there are so many people who have these private, like no post face or Instagram that actually turn out to be real people. So unless they cause a problem, I just, I just ignore them. And generally when you are building your following, um, I usually do a really quick process of somebody follows me. I click through, I scroll through either the top three tweets or the top three Instagram posts and go, yes, I want to follow this person. No, I do not want to follow this person. If they're clearly not a bot, I might just go ahead and click like, or leave a comment just because I appreciate that they've taken the time to follow me, but then sorry, I'm not interested. I'm just going to move on. Um, so think about too, how you want to spend your time. You know, if you're seeing people where it's like, oh, I would like to engage with this person. I like what they have to say, then engage with them. And if they don't, they don't, whether that's a bot or a scammer or a stalker or anyone, you just don't have to engage with anybody you don't feel like engaging with. We are going to dive into some breakout rooms just for five minutes. Um, you do not have to join a breakout room. It is never as weird as you think it's going to be. 
Um, when we come back, we are going to give you the number one thing that you can do today to get your book into the world and into the hands of the readers who need it. And we'll also tell you a little bit about the next episode. So we will just take five minutes and enjoy your breakouts, or you can stay here with us in the main room and uh, ask us any other questions. Yay, Jacqueline. All right. Jacqueline, do you want to be sent into a breakout room? Yeah, I don't care. I, I was on my phone in the car for most of it. So that's probably why I like wasn't in your queue to be redistributed. No problem. I'm just double checking to make sure nobody's gotten left alone. I'll go into one. I accidentally hit leave breakout room by mistake. <laughs> I will totally send you. What is your name? Mara. Mara. Let me find you, Mara. Where I did you? exactly what Mara did. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Okay, Mara, I'm going to move you to room one. And there you go. Tell me your name, other person. I've got the breakout room window open. Sorry, I'm Rachel. Thank you. Rachel. Yay. Let me find you, Rachel. Thank Rachel you. Rachel Clark? Yep. Yep. That's me. Awesome. There you Thank go. You. Off you go. Anybody else want to be sent into a breakout room? Oh, go ahead. Send me. <laughs> you sound so enthusiastic. Well, now there's nobody, you know, everybody disappeared. <laughs> awesome. All right. I have sent you along. I have sent you along. Anybody who is still here, we are so glad to have you. Oops, that person got left alone. Let me move them. All right. I just had to go check my Twitter. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I'm just scrolling one more time to make sure nobody got left alone alone. Such good questions today. Yeah, really good questions. I'm so excited. Okay, so there's a couple of five person rooms and they just won't all get to speak and that's okay. It is what it right. is. Yeah. Cool, right. cool. Um, do you have a thing to do today that you want to add beyond the mission thing? Yeah, let me see. Okay. Hmm. Mm. All right, I think everybody's busy. Okay, yeah, what I'm gonna do is encourage people to post less, connect more. Instead of thinking about what they should post, go to a comp author's account, see what people are talking about, add to the conversation, right? Like Sounds I think we're great. all, we're gonna learn more doing that. Okay, and so if you do if you do that and I'll do mission and I think I will stick with those slightly maudlin last words. I love it. I, I love it so me. much. <laughs> the world is making me sad right now i you know what i right i would love just um just like a, a williamsisms uh roundup like i would love like a recording where it's just you know your last a happy word. message of the day <laughs> i would yeah i would love to just listen to that on repeat if i'm having a sad day you know like like oprah's last episode is really really highly viewed <laughs> YouTube because it's like, oh, just put that on. And it's like, oh yeah, meaning of life reminded right here, right? Um, yeah. I think that would be Love great. that. Thank you. You're welcome. That makes me feel meaningful. Oh, you are meaningful. <laughs> Love you so much. And and the way you choose your words for all of us. Thank you. I'm so glad we do this thing. It makes me so happy. And I'm so glad that like you and I started it and that it actually worked. I know. Like, and I tell people all the time, I've never had a partner in my life who I accomplished so much with, with so little work. Like it's like, it's there's so, right. It's just like, yeah, just Thanks, the way Danielle. that we fit together. Yeah. Well, and you and I have said it to each other before, but it's really nice that like, we don't sit down and assign jobs. Stuff just gets done. It just gets done. It's really so lovely. 
I gave everybody the two minute warning in the breakout Wonderful. rooms. Hey, Charlotte. Hi, Charlotte. Welcome. And I'm going to hit close all rooms. Charlotte, are you just jumping in for the first time today? No, you're on okay. mute. Okay. No, okay, but no, I, no, got I was on I the understood. whole time. I was on Good. the whole time. I just had to jump off for a minute. Good. Just didn't Glad know you're if we back. had to go into that welcome, but the time change. Yeah. <laughs> We're good. All good. No. East Coast all the way. Back. Okay, I'm awesome. Where are you, in. Charlotte? I'm East Coast. Uh, I'm in uh, Connecticut, West Hartford, Connecticut. Mm. Been there a lot for skating competitions. I live out just outside Philadelphia. Oh, okay, great. It's a gorgeous day here today. I should be in the garden, but I'm it glad is. I'm with you guys. <laughs> There's still the day is long. That's right. Yay. I'm going to get to meet Charlotte in person. I'm so excited. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Where? Italy. Oh, Charlotte's coming amazing. to Italy in October. Yeah, Ooh. amazing. Cool, cool. Buick, I've really been loving your posts lately. I always love your posts, but Thank just I feel like I feel like there's like this. I don't know. I feel like I'm carried from post to post. Like oh, there's awesome. this cohesive kind of feeling. Like you're like, and I'd like to offer you this, and I'd like <laughs> to offer this, and I'm like, I was ready for that, and I didn't even know. Awesome. Thank you. Right. I've been much more present on socials lately. I'm trying it out. <laughs> it's really working for you, Buick. And it feels like you have really important things to say. And it's been, it's been enlightening me. And like Buick is a really great example, folks, when we're talking about like your mission. So Buick's primary mission is getting her music into the world, which is beautiful and which I love listening to. Look her up on YouTube. But Buick's <laughs> secondary mission is helping people be aware of sexism and bad practices in the music music industry. And I'm really fascinated by that too, because it's such an interesting window into that world that I might not have otherwise thought of, you know, so she's got me as a reader because she makes me happy and she makes me think. And so I really like that a lot. And she's a great example to look at, look at all her socials. Thank you, friends. You're so welcome. Um, as we wrap up and give you our top tips and our last words, we want to let you know, please feel free to forward the replay email to a writer friend. That is totally legit. We love it. If you share the Writer's Bridge with other people, you might encourage them to sign up. Um, also, we invite you to join us for our next episode, which will be do-overs. It's one of our most popular topics. We always have a great time. Um, you can respond to the email with a link to a social post that flies or your essay with a million rejections. And we will tell you why it's not working and what to do instead. And we just love doing those so much. It is so much fun. Ashley, what can we do today to sell our books, to make our platform better? Mm -hmm. It's going to be counterintuitive. First thing I'm going to tell you to do is to open up your camera. If you are on your laptop, if you'd be willing to take a photo of this, post it to your Facebook stories or Instagram stories, tag us. If you want to let us know the, your favorite thing or takeaway from today, that's really helpful to us. We really love the feedback. Woo, take it fast. <laughs> okay. And after you post that, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take off the stress of creating content and posting. If you feel like you should do something for social media, take a walk around the block and then ask yourself again if maybe you needed that or you did it if you really feel like you should do something on social media go to a comp account take a look at the conversations that people have been having there over the past couple of days what is really pulling at people's heartstrings right now because week to week to week it, it changes a little right where's where where their focus is and what they need um and then i want you to start asking yourself how can I offer support right now without making a quote card or a damn reel or anything? How can I offer support to someone else in those comments? Don't worry about commenting to the account holder. Comment to one of their audience members. I hear you. Thank you for pointing that out. That was so helpful. Okay. Think of how you can connect and offer support just by being yourself, not thinking you need to create something that then is going to help people. Think about your mission. What impact do you want your work to have in the world? And where are the people who need you? 
Our last words for today, it is a rough time right now in the world. And one of the greatest things we have in this Writer's Bridge community is that we lift each other up and we support each other's work. And I think that is one small candle that we are lighting in the darkness. Everyone is welcome here. It doesn't matter if you're an experienced writer or a brand new beginning writer. It doesn't matter what your genre, your gender, your race, your religion, or anything else. We won't always get it right, but we'll try. And we are having our number one reason here is to be with you. And we hope that your number one reason here is to be with each other. So thank you for honoring us and honoring your work and honoring your readers with your time and attention. And go ahead and unmute yourselves for a joyful goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 There we go. Bye, Jill. Bye, Bye Jan. Bye, Jill. Bye, Ashley. Bye, Kirsten. Bye. Bye.